All right, Pastor. Give them heaven. Amen. <laughs> There's a story behind that. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell it to you. <laughs> Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, my text is uh, that one little verse out of the gospel reading. Uh, John chapter 13 is the beginning of John's telling of the, what happened the last week of Jesus' life. And right there at the beginning, before he even goes to the upper room and talks about foot washing, he has this verse that says, Having loved his own who were in the world... He loved them to the end. Sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus. Do we have, uh, yeah. I'm not getting it on the monitor. Uh, we'll just count on the script, okay? Sisters and brothers in Christ. Two weeks ago it was Matthew. Last week it was Mark. And this week we will be reading in our Read Scripture Challenge the Gospel of John. It's a great uh, it's a great gospel. Uh, John is just a wonderful uh, disciple, uh, apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. John has a brother by the name of James. Both of them were fishermen. They were called by Jesus. Uh, Matthew says, while they were mending their nets. The Zebedee brothers, you know, uh, they, had a, they had a mother who just loved them too. She came to Jesus one day and said, uh, can you put Jimmy on one side in your kingdom and Johnny on the other? You know, she wanted the best for those boys. John was also, of course, that one disciple that we know of that was at the foot of the cross on Good Friday because we know Jesus commended Mother Mary into his care. John, who after Pentecost joined Peter in bold witness right in the center of Jerusalem, speaking to Caiaphas and the other Jewish leaders and accusing them of having put to death the Son of God. And uh, they, of course, wanted him to be quiet about that sort of thing and and uh, John and Peter says, we can't, we can't obey you. we got to obey God, and we can't help telling you these things. And, and Luke, the uh, writer of Acts, uh, makes a comment about that. He says, they were just plain, uneducated men, but you could tell they had been with Jesus. Huh? You could tell they had been with Jesus. Next slide up there. Yeah. You could tell they had been with Jesus. Well, they had. On the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember Peter, James, and John in the upper room in the Garden of Gethsemane. And again, on that Easter morning when the women came back from the tomb and said that Jesus was not there, that the angel said he had risen, John and Peter ran as fast as they could to the tomb and they saw the very same thing. John recognized by tradition to be the only disciple who died a natural death was not was not uh, persecuted for his faith, although I don't really think that's true either. Here he was, a 90-year-old a man living in Ep Ephesus where he had taken Mother Mary, and, uh, and Domitian wanted everybody in Asia Minor to bow down to him as Caesar, as Lord. John refused, and so he was exiled to the island of Patmos. We read he was under a military taskmaster. He was half-naked. He was hungry exiled there from Ephesus to the island of Patmos because he wouldn't bow down to the Roman emperor. Well, while he was in Ephesus and before the exile, he wrote those three letters to the churches in Asia Minor uh, that we read from 1 John. And 1 uh, John uh, is known as the epistle of love. And uh, you heard some of that when Pastor read it today. And then, of course, while he was on the island of Patmos, while he was in prison there, on the exiled island of Patmos, he received that revelation on the day of the Lord, on Sunday. Jesus came to him and said, John, this is Jesus. I'm going to show you something, and I want you to write it down and send it to the churches. And, uh, and so he really wrote five books of the New Testament, but we're going to concentrate today on the gospel. Uh, now, John wrote the gospel also after Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already written theirs. And so he doesn't repeat a lot of the things that the other gospel writers tell us about Jesus' teachings, his parables, his miracles. John rather goes off kind of in another direction and teaches us some theology about Jesus. Very important theology. As a matter of fact, in chapter 1, his Christmas story is so short and so simple. It's really only one verse long. He sets the stage, first of all, by saying in chapter 1, right away in the first verses, 
He says, uh, Jesus was God. He was, he was in the beginning when the whole world was created. And he is full of God's grace and God's truth and God's glory. And then in verse 14, we are taken to Bethlehem. And in one verse, it says he became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, or Eugene Peterson in his paraphrase of the Bible uh, that I'm reading, our Read Scripture Challenge in this year, his, he came into our neighborhood. He came into our neighborhood, huh? And John says that allowed us to see the glory of God with our own eyes. This one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, inside and out, from start to finish. And this morning, I want us then to examine four key lessons that you will find throughout the pages of the Gospel of John as you read it this week. But before I do go through those four lessons, I want you to understand John's reason for writing us, for giving us this theology. He says way at the end in chapters 20 and 21, he says in essence, Jesus did a lot of other things, so many that if they were all written down, you wouldn't have room in your library for all of them. But I wrote these down. I'm sharing these lessons so that you might know confidence, so that you might know that Jesus is the Christ and believing in him, you might have life in his name. So here are the four lessons then that the Gospel of John nails down for us. Don't you ever forget, John says, that Jesus is God who moved into our neighborhood. He became incarnate. He took upon himself our flesh. He dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Everything that's in the Father we have in Jesus. Number two, don't you ever forget that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And don't you ever forget, number three, that Jesus has overcome your three worst enemies. Not China, not inflation, not the stock market. Sin, death, and the power of the devil. You can't handle any one of those three, neither can I. But Jesus could. And John wants us to know for certain, no doubts, that Jesus was victorious. And then the fourth thing, throughout the Gospel of John we see God's divine love displayed in the life and times of Jesus Christ who gave us this new commandment to love God and to love our neighbor, to love one another. Now I'm going to piggyback right now and uh, take a little time in this sermon for a commercial. Pastor Josh already mentioned it. Uh, I, I don't have time in the next 10 minutes to go through these four lessons. But in the next six weeks, at that 945 Bible study, I started this morning, just barely got started. So if you didn't, weren't there, you didn't miss that much. Oh, that's not a right, good, very good way to put it, is it? <laughs> you missed a lot if you weren't there. But if you come next week, we'll really get into these four lessons, 945, in the sanctuary. Now back to our regularly scheduled sermon. <laughs> All right, lesson number one. We're going to take each one of them in turn. Jesus is God. Throughout the gospel, you read it. As a matter of fact, as you read it, you'll be reading a lot of it this week, I want you to try to find the seven I am's where he says, I am something. You know, Moses asked God when God sent him to Pharaoh to tell the Pharaoh to let his people go back at the time of the Exodus. Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And God says, you tell him I am sent you. I am. It's a word for Yahweh, Jehovah. It's the word for I am always there. I am in the present tense all the time, right? Well, there are seven I am's in the Gospel of John. I'll give you a couple clues. In chapter 10, you, you know this because of Good Shepherd Sunday every year. I am the Good Shepherd, chapter 10. Chapter 6, we have I am the Bread of Life. Huh? You find the other five. But maybe most important is in chapter 8, where he says, Before Abraham was even born, I am. He just claimed the title itself, I am, which is, yeah, I'm God. I'm Jehovah. I'm Yahweh. And, of course, that was blasphemy for any, any human being to say among the Jews of that day, if, of course, it wasn't true. But it was true. But the Jewish leaders in chapter 8, because of that, picked up stones to kill him. That was the, that was the penalty for blasphemy. And they were ready to stone him to death, except his time had not yet come. 
and he disappeared. Lesson number one, John wants us to know Jesus is Jehovah, God, Yahweh. It's all over his gospel. He says, I and the Father are one. Lesson number two, in the very first chapter of John's gospel, he has Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, pointing to Jesus and saying, behold, right there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And remember, of course, John was the only disciple that we know of that was at the foot of the cross when Jesus' drops of blood perhaps came raining down from his forehead, came down from the Savior of the world, the very drops of blood that we commemorate and that we, in fact, partake of in this blessed sacrament. The sacrifices of the Old Testament, all of them were sealed in the blood of the Lamb, the atonement Lamb. And John makes sure to teach us that it was Christ's sacrificial blood that won for us the forgiveness of sins and where there is forgiveness, Luther says there is also life and salvation. I am the good shepherd who becomes the lamb whose blood sets us free to be people of God. Lesson number three. On the third day from John's darkest hour in his life, Good Friday, came his most joyous day. Running with Peter to the tomb, they found it empty and rejoiced then to see the risen Christ for the next 40 days in many different settings before Christ ascended into heaven. John celebrated this Easter lesson by assuring us that the open tomb was the stamp of God the Father's approval that Jesus had won the victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. Even, even death could not hold him, and the devil could not defeat him, and sin could not last in the victory of Jesus Christ. And he, John wanted you to be certain of that. No doubt about it. Your sin is forgiven, death is defeated, and the devil has no power over the child of God. Now I want to spend the rest of my time on lesson number four, the lesson in love. And let me remind you of what Christians for years have referred to as the gospel in a nutshell. It's in John's gospel, right? 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John's gospel is loaded with God so loved the world. Divine love and the call for Christ-like love to be seen in your life and mine. The gospel lesson read earlier is from, as I said, that first chapter 13 uh, when John starts to tell about Holy Week. And the very first words about Holy Week are, Jesus loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. And in chapter 15, we have the, I am the vine, you are the branches. Oops, there's another I am I told you about. Uh, I'm going to, might end up telling you all of them if I keep going. Huh? I am the vine, you are the branches. And he says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. As a matter of fact, he says, by this you will know that you are my disciples, that you are Missouri Synod Lutherans. No, that's not what he says. <laughs> by this you will know that you are my disciples, that you speak in tongues. Mm -mm, he doesn't say that either. He says, by this you will know my disciples, that you love one another. And John certainly is one who knows about the love of Jesus. Because in chapter 20, he testifies, the women came from the tomb and told Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that the tomb was empty. Now, we might think that's kind of a braggart thing. You know, John is the only gospel writer who, who refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, it's not being a braggart. It's the truth. Jesus loved John. Jesus loves you. And until you make that personal, by grace, through faith, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you cannot possibly love one another. It's got to start with God loves you. And that's what John was trying to tell us. Years ago, this got real personal for me when I came upon a book that was written by Max Licato, and it was, uh, it was called Just Like Jesus. Yeah, there it is. 
And Max writes in that book, it's dangerous to sum up grand truths in one simple statement, but I'm going to try. If a sentence or two could capture God's desire for each of us, it might read like this. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. Pastor Licato goes on in that book to say, God's love never ceases, never. Though we spurn him, ignore him, reject him, despise him, disobey him, he will not change. Our evil cannot diminish our, his love. Our goodness cannot increase it. Our faith does not earn it any more than our stupidity jeopardizes it. God doesn't love us less if we fail or more if we succeed. God's love never ceases. He loves you just the way you are, but he doesn't want to leave you that way. So let's consider then what Christ-like love looks like. It's going to be sacrificial. It's going to be unconditional. It's going to be risky. As a matter of fact, it's going to be a huge challenge for you and for me. Christ-like love is a battle for me every day of my life. Let me explain with some examples. The first one is from a story I'm going to tell you about Eddie. He was one of Al Capone's mob members, a slick lawyer back in the days of the Chicago mobsters. He ran the crooked dog tracks. What Eddie did was he arranged for the overfeeding of seven of the dogs, and then he bet on the eighth one. And he got rich, and he was popular. And then he turned himself in and squealed on Capone's mob. Why? Didn't he know the consequences of ratting on the mob? Yeah, he knew. But he had made up his mind. It was for his son that he ratted on Capone. He loved his son. He had smelled the stench of the underground for virtually all of his life, and he wanted something better for his son. So in order to give his son a good name, somehow he would have to clear his own name. Well, Eddie never got to see his dream come true because after he squealed on the mob, they murdered him. Was it worth it? Well, for his son it was. His son has one of the most famous names in the world. But I'm not going to tell you what that is right now. I want to tell you some more stories about risky, self-sacrificing love. Love that goes out on a limb. Love that makes a statement. Love that leaves a legacy. Sacrificial, Christ-like love. A love that has to do with self-denial. It has to do with giving up something that your selfish sin wants you to hang on to. It has to do with self-control and spirit-led willpower. You parents know about it. That's another example. You deny yourself because of the greater good, your unconditional love for your children. My parents were dirt poor southern Minnesota farmers. They worked hard, really hard, for only a most basic way of life. So they could both give me and my sister a chance at a better life. So many, along, uh, uh, so many of you, I know you, are like Susan and I. We would sacrifice whatever is necessary for our kids. And now, of course, let me add our grandkids. It's a simple example of self-denial. We love our own. We love them to the end. So what about another example? It's the one from the gospel, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. You know, as they all entered the upper room that night, they probably saw that basin of water and that towel over there in the corner, but they didn't see any slave that was ready to wash their feet. So that was the job of a slave, to wash the feet. Peter and John had been tasked to make the arrangements for the Last Supper. It was a borrowed room, but the two of them obviously had overlooked the foot washing thing. So as they recline at the table, my hunch is that each of the disciples felt a little uncomfortable. And they start to thinking themselves. Peter is probably thinking, don't these other disciples know how important I am? 
Jesus called me the rock. He said he was going to build his church on me. They should all be over there right now grabbing that towel and basin and coming to wash Jesus' feet and my feet. And I expect each of the other disciples were also hoping that somebody else would volunteer. And they were busy trying to justify why they didn't have to. So let me tell you another story about four church members. Here are their names. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. One day there was an important job to be done in the church and everybody was asked to do it. But everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but in the end, nobody did it. Somebody got angry that nobody did it because it was everybody's job. Everybody just thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. And so it ended up that everybody blamed somebody, and when nobody did what anybody could have, nothing got done. You want me to read that over again? Did you get lost somewhere in there? And here are the 12 disciples, all leaning around the table in the upper room, hoping that somebody was going to volunteer to wash feet. And then in the midst of all that thought and all the talk about great, greatness and power, Jesus stands up and without a word takes off his outer garment, picks up the water bowl and the towel, and washes feet. And when he is done, he says, Do you understand what I have done for you? I have set you an example of humble, self-denial, sacrificial love. And you're going to find examples all over the Gospel of John. You'll see it on every page as you follow our Lord who gives us, gives us this divine and eternal example. Which brings me back to Eddie, huh? the Chicago mobster. Had Eddie lived to see his son Butch grow up, he would have been proud. Proud of his commission to the Annapolis Naval Academy. Proud of Butch's service in World War II as a Navy pilot. Proud of his son for downing five enemy bombers in the Pacific while saving hundreds of crewmen on the carrier Lexington. Oh, his name was cleared all right. So much so, so that Butch received the Congressional Medal of Honor. And when people say the name O'Hara in Chicago, they don't think about mobsters. They think about aviation heroism. And now when you say that name, you have something else to think about. The risky love of a gangster gone good who had a son. You think of Eddie O'Hara. And when you think about the 12 disciples, don't forget the disciple whom Jesus loved. That would be John. We know it because John tells us, Jesus loved me. Just like we sang in that praise song earlier in the service. He wasn't a braggart. Nope, he was teaching us a fundamental lesson in God-given love. You got to first experience it yourself. You've got to first understand how much God in Jesus Christ loves you. And you should never forget these four lessons from the Gospel of John. Happy reading this, this week. John's Gospel is precious because John's Jesus is what it's all about. In his name, amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding Keep your hearts and minds with Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.